Um, Sam asked me to preach for him this uh, week. He had to go out of town, and he asked me to step in for him, and I was, of course, delighted to do so. And uh, I've been reading the same book that uh, he has been reading, and that is uh, Vance Havner's book, um, Hearts of Fire. It's a wonderful book. If you can get your hands on it, I would recommend I would recommend it to you. But uh, in that book, Havner, let me get to my verse first. In that book, Havner, uh, Vance Havner says, uh, he speaks of the unsaved in the congregation of the Lord. And he refers to them as being starched and pressed but not washed. And when I read that, I said, that just sounds like a good title for a message. So I told Sam last week, I said, Sam, I haven't fleshed this out yet. I haven't written it out. I don't know exactly where I'm taking it, but I said, uh, God gave me a title, or, or I read a title, and I thought it would be a great message uh, for our church, and that is starched and pressed, but not washed. Um, Billy Sunday called these people that are in the congregation of the Lord but unsaved, he called them heavenly devils. The Holy Spirit pressed upon the heart of Agur, the writer of Proverbs, to write these words, and we find them in Proverbs 30, 12. You're going to love this because it's only one verse and it's short, and so you won't have to stand long. But as you find... Proverbs 30, 12, would you stand as we read this short verse? Proverbs 30, 12 says, There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filth. Let's bow our heads. Father God, how true this is. As we look around in our world today, Father, we, we see the truth of this statement that Agur makes here in Proverbs. Father, we see that uh, there are men and women who masquerade, who parade around and uh, appear to be righteous, but underneath, Lord, there is no repentance, there is no sanctification going on. Father, they are just uh, taking your name in vain because they're wearing it around as a, as a badge of honor. And it's like the soldier, Father, that would claim that merit of honor without having been to war. Father, we just pray today that you will open our hearts to this message, that you will make each one of us stop and consider where we are and consider our own lives and consider... Father, what we need, where we need to be. And if we are indeed one who is starched and pressed but not washed, we just ask your blessings on this message today in the name of Jesus. Amen. The writer of this proverb, particular proverb, is identified as Agur. We're not absolutely sure who he was. But anyway, he uh, wrote this as a prophecy and a warning to a generation to come uh, that would consider itself pure even though it was not washed. And that's a, a pretty uh, profound statement. Um, as we look at the church today and search our own hearts, we question, a question must come to our mind. Are we that generation? Are we that generation? As I look around, it sure seems like it to me. It's easy for somebody to look good when they're dressed in a suit that is starched and pressed, especially if they have their hair brushed, or their hair combed and their teeth brushed. It's good to look good, but... You've heard somebody say, oh, you clean up nicely. <laughs> yeah. 
See, that's supposed to be a compliment, but it's really a way of saying, I know what you really look like. I know what you look like in your old overalls. I know what you look like from day to day. I know what you look like underneath all that starching and pressing. When I was a paramedic instructor, program director at Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College for the paramedic program, we were doing our very first site visit. The um, accreditation team was coming to evaluate our program to see if we would meet the accreditation standards. And, of course, this was the first one I had ever attended, and I was nervous as a, as a cat. And um, I dressed up. That, that day I made sure I got me a good shower. I shaved. I put on the, you know, the stuff that smells good. And I put on my suit, my best suit, and my tie, and all of that. I looked wonderful, y'all. I went to school, and the first thing when I walked in the door, people began to say, whoa, you're dressed up. Oh, you look nice today. I said, shh, shh. I don't want it. I said, don't say that, because I, if the team walks in and they hear you saying, you sure look good today, they're going to think, I look bad most days. <laughs> I said, I don't want them to think that I usually look bad and today I look good. I want them to think that this is the way I look every day when I come to school. But that's the way we are. We want people to judge us by our outward appearance. I've given some thought to this, and probably you have too. And you're going to probably think this is silly. Why did Mama tell me to always make sure I had on clean underwear in case I got in an accident? <laughs> Are the doctors and nurses really, really looking at my underwear? <laughs> Are they going to think less of me if I have dirty underwear? <laughs> no. And that's not what my mama was worried about either. She wasn't worried about what they were going to think of me. She was worried about what they were going to think of her. They, she didn't want them to think that she was a mother that couldn't even keep her child in clean underwear. <laughs> what she really was worried about was that. It was herself. In the same way, God is uh, judged by others according to what they see in us. When others see our underwear, and what I mean by that is our underneath person, and we do show that, we may as well be wearing the droopy drawers, you know, the pants down to here, because people can, people can see our underwear, our under person, our underneath person. And when they see that, they, they don't always see good. And they form an opinion. They may form an opinion of us, but they will also form an opinion of our God. So it's very important that we are clean, not just on the outside, but also on the inside. As I stand here in this pulpit and look out over the congregation, I cannot see your underwear, thank goodness. <laughs> That's the real underneath person that you are. I can't see that. But God does see that. When God sent Samuel out to anoint David as king, the first person that Samuel encountered was David's brother, uh, uh, and he was tall and handsome and strong, and Samuel said to himself, this must be the one that God wants me to anoint. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his stature because I have rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees for the humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. Friend, let me tell you, you may be tall and handsome 
in your own piety. You may be proud of your own religiosity. While your heart is in an eyesore to God, you may be patting yourself on the back because you managed to get up 10 minutes early so that you can breeze through a scripture real quick so that you can say that you've read your Bible. You may be patting yourself on the back because you always say a blessing before you eat. And you may be pat patting yourself on the back because you tend to make it to church most Sundays. But let me tell you, that's not what the Lord is looking for. The Lord is looking for those that will worship Him in truth and in spirit. He's looking for those that will uh, turn their underneath life over to Him so that He can give them an underneath blessing of His presence so that we will be able to show the world who our God really is. Jesus said of the scribes and Pharisees of his day, he said this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside of it may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like whitened sepulchers or tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of the bones of the dead and every kind of impurity. In the same way, on the outside, you seem righteous to, to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And then he says snakes, he calls them snakes, brood of vipers. How can you escape being condemned to hell? Whoa. You better be serious about God. You better be turning your life over to him, really, instead of just religion, because religion will not get you anywhere. Our goodness will not get us anywhere. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ, accepting Him as your Lord and Savior, believing in Him as the risen Lord, the, the Messiah, the one who was to come, the one who took our sins upon Him. The only road to heaven is Jesus. And I say that without worrying about anybody telling me that I'm closed-minded because there are other avenues. I'm telling you, there is no other avenue other than Jesus Christ. And when we survey our life, when we look within ourselves, we need to ask ourselves some really important questions. How sincere am I? How do I serve the Lord? Uh, who is Jesus to me? What, am I, what have I given him of myself? All of these are important questions. As we preachers stand up here in the pulpit and look out over the congregation, you know what I see? I see starched and pressed Christians, men and women, ready for heaven. Y'all all look like you're ready for heaven. If a bus pulled up, I believe you'd all get on it or at least from what I see, you seem to be quite religious and quite clean. But see, we can't see the condition of your heart. We do not know if we're preaching to a band of angels or to a brood of vipers. But I suspect that there might at least be one or two snakes in here I'm not saying that to be ugly or mean. I'm saying that to wake you up. Jesus called the Pharisees a brood of vipers. And it was because they were trying to be what they weren't. 
Outward religiosity can only take you so far. And in the day of judgment, when we stand before an eternal and holy God, that will, be, that will not be far enough. He says there is a generation that will appear pure in their own eyes. What does that look like? What does pure in your own eyes look like? Well, here are some examples. It is Simon the Pharisee despising the sinful woman at Jesus' feet. It is the Pharisee thanking God he is not as bad as the publican. It is the Jew condemning the man born blind, the Jews condemning the man born blind and his parents. It is a man who will not say he is sorry even when proven wrong. It is boasting in knowing, of knowing God but being unable to get along with others. It is saying the Spirit teaches you without ever opening up His Word. It is the self-indulgence of the obese who then condemns the one who drinks. It is the smoker who smugly puts down the drug addict for their inability to stop using. It is the mouth that praises God on Sunday and then cusses out his boss on Monday. It is the one who declares their trust and reliance on God but purchases the lottery ticket in hopes of securing their future. It is the one who gives his full tithe every Sunday but stingily withholds assistance to a neighbor who is in need. Should I go on or do you get the picture? If you do get the picture, who is in the frame of that picture? Did you see yourself in any of that? John Piper writes, The heart is what you are. In the secrecy of your thought and feeling, when nobody knows but God and what you are at the invisible root matters as much to God as what you are at the visible branch I would go even a step farther than Piper and I would say that it is the root that God is more concerned about we have the ability to hide our impurity from others, but it never goes hidden from God. He knows what the root is like. He knows what is underneath that we never show anyone else. So he says there's coming a generation, there is a generation, that considers itself pure in its own eyes. And then he says, yet, this is the second part of that, yet, yet, is not washed from his filth. Did you know sin is filth to God? Even our righteousness, the Bible tells us, is like dirty rags before God. There's no way we can impress God. And sin is a filth and a stench in his nose. There's a reoccurring message in Scripture. We find it in Ecclesiastes 7.20, in Psalms 14.3, and in Psalms 53.3, and in Romans 3.9. And here it is. There is none righteous. Not even one. Not even one who is righteous. Did you hear that and did you receive that? How can we be anything else than a guilty soul as we stand before a holy God? How can we, be, how can we claim purity when we remain in the filth of this world? We can't. We are all guilty and deserving of hell. For you to say otherwise is to call God a liar. 
and it's to make Christ's death upon the cross null and void. For you to rely on anything you have, you have done or anything that you have said or any prayer that you may have prayed or any hand that you might have shaken or any form that you might have filled out to join the church, to rely upon any of that is disastrous. There is only one way, as I said earlier, to salvation, and that is through the cross, the blood of Jesus. And I'm telling you that God sent His only Son into this earth so that He could die upon that cross for our sins. And we owe God that uh, awe and respect and honor for what he has done for us. And we owe him our life. And he wants everything. He does not want us to be starched and pressed and left unwashed. What if somebody came straight from the pogey plant? And I say that because my son works out there. Straight from the pogey, and you all, you smelt that. Straight from the pogey plant, don't take a shower. Rushes home, puts on his suit, has a stark shirt, just got his suit from the cleaners. Comes into church and sits down beside you. How long would it take you to realize that he was starched and pressed, but not washed? Maybe just a minute or two. And you would, you would, the stench would give him away. So when we appear before God, sometimes that's what we do. We rush out of the world with all of our sin and we, we rush in before God looking all righteous and holy with our, our suit starched and pressed and, and we send that stench into his nostrils. He smells that. He smells and senses and knows that sin that we've just come from. How can we achieve purity? Purity that is in our heart and not just in our heads. There's only one way, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. Coming to know Him as the living, risen person that He really is, rather than the legend that you have read about all your life. It is having the Holy Spirit come into your life and change your life eternally. Ryan, you can attest to that. We were just talking about that. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation a substitute through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Folks, I might have said a lot of hard things today and, and, and you may be wondering why is Brother Gary being so hard and why is he preaching this message? It, it, it's not because I've seen anything in you. Like I said earlier, you all look like you're ready for heaven. But it's what I've seen in myself. In my quiet times, when I'm alone with myself, when I have to face my own situation I know that I do not measure up I am not pure in myself in my own living I am not pure and holy but I am washed I am washed I am washed in the blood of the Lamb 
I love that song. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? I am. Because the blood of the Lamb cleanses me from all unrighteousness. It's all washed away. As I stand before God, I can stand not in my righteousness, but in His. He took my sin upon Him so that I could stand in His righteousness. What are you relying on today for your salvation? Could it be that you just, you're like the scribes and the Pharisees, a whitened, washed tomb on the outside, but filthy and full of dead men's bones on the inside? It's easy to tell. Simply ask yourself, when was the last time you looked at your life and saw sin? When was the last time you became broken before God because of sin? When was the last time you repented in tears? If you don't recall, then I submit to you that you are pure in your own eyes, but maybe unwashed. David's prayer is one that I love. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion completely. Wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before my eyes. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was uh, born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self. And you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with your hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Wow. So the message today is, are you starched? Impressed, but not washed. And if so, there is, you can be washed today. Just as David said, we just have to cry out to God and, and ask Him to wash, up with his, wash us with His hyssop and we'll be whiter than snow. He, he looks at the inner person, not the outer person. You may be sitting here today and, and, and saying to yourself, well, Maybe that's me. Maybe I'm not sincere in my faith. Maybe I haven't given my life to God, to Christ. If it is you today, here's your opportunity. And I, and I, and I read a preacher this week, and I tend to agree with him. I don't tend, I do agree with him. It's not walking down the aisle, taking the preacher's hand that's going to save you. It is coming before God in humility and in brokenness and repenting of your sin and asking God to cleanse you. You can do that right where you sit. Or you can come down here if you need some guidance. I'll be glad to talk with you. I'll be glad to pray with you. So if you need some guidance, come and talk to me and pray. I'll pray with you. But if not, even if you don't want to get up and walk down the aisle, that's not the issue. It's not shaking the preacher's hand. It's not filling out a card. It is looking up to God, and it's looking within yourself and asking yourself those, those serious questions and then asking God to give you the answers and seeing where you are. And if you're not right with God, today is the day to get ready. I had, as I said earlier, that good friend of mine who passed away yesterday. Never would have dreamed in a hundred years that she would be gone today. I mean, if you had asked me day before yesterday, I would have said, no. But the fact is, she is. Her sister called me last night in tears to tell me. 
We never know when the time will come. We never know how much time we have on this earth. We never know when we're going to be called before the judgment seat of God. So the time is now. Now or maybe never. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this uh, message that you've given me, and I just pray, God, that you'll use it to change our lives, to give us a, a new look into our inner self. Father, that we might come to depend and rely on you only, on the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus only. Father, if there's anyone here today who's found themselves uh, filthy or dirty and needs washing, that you would uh, move their heart, move in their heart and their soul today and bring them to the cross. We just uh, give this time of invitation over to you and ask your Holy Spirit to draw and move as he will. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Now I'm going to be down front if you would like to come and uh, I can pray with you. I can counsel with you. Or you can come and just kneel at the altar here. If God has spoken to your heart today, come and, and get it right with God.